Good afternoon. Today, being the World Physiotherapy Day, we are all here with the most remarkable webinar of Colombo Physiotherapy Week 2021, organized by the Physiotherapy Students Welfare Society of Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, to commemorate the World Physiotherapy Day today. I take this opportunity to welcome you all to, the, to this webinar on acute rehabilitation of COVID patients brought to you amidst this prevailing pandemic as the final program of Colombo Physiotherapy Week 2021. I take it as an honor to acknowledge the presence of our guest speaker of this session, Samantha Cook from UK. She's a highly specialist physiotherapist in critical care. With that, I cordially invite the moderator of this session, Mr. Ashan Vijaykom, who is a lecturer in physiotherapy at Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, to take this session forward. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Pasrina. Good afternoon once again, everyone, and welcome to the today's webinar on uh, acute rehabilitation of COVID patients. I'm Ashan. I'm a lecturer in physiotherapy attached to Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. I'll be moderating the session today. Uh, as Vasrina said, uh, this is the final uh, webinar in a series hosted by the Physiotherapy Students Welfare Society, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. And uh, this, uh, I think this is one of the most important uh, because everyone would agree with me that the pandemic situation uh, triggered by COVID-19 has now become a part of our daily lives. In the previous year and a half, almost all the nations, I think, have been devising methods to combat this. And, uh, you know, healthcare providers are putting their lives on the line uh, to save the infected. Among them, uh, physiotherapists uh, as frontline healthcare workers play a critical role in the treatment of COVID patients, particularly in the acute stage, the ICU management and then the inward management. Uh, you know that a, a large number of uh, studies have been conducted throughout the world to establish the best treatment options uh, for COVID patients. Many countries, including Sri Lanka, currently at a critical point in terms of uh, daily positive cases and uh, the mortality rate. So the experience and knowledge of an expert in the field would highly benef benefit the peer physiotherapist and ultimately the patients. So today we have here Samantha Cook, uh, who is one of the best to speak on this area. She's a highly specialist physiotherapist in critical care. Uh, Samantha graduated as a physiotherapist uh, from the University of the West of London in 2011 and has completed MSc modules in rehabilitation after critical illness at uh, Brunel University, London. She was an intern at the National Health uh, National Institute of Health Research, and uh, she's a member of the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy in the United Kingdom, and is currently working at the Bart's NHS uh, Bart's Health NHS Trust. She has extensive critical care experience in cardiothoracic, major trauma, and uh, neurocritical care. Uh, so thank you so much. Samantha for accepting our invitation and agreeing to share your expertise with us, uh, spending your valuable time and effort. Today, uh, she will present an overview of acute physiotherapic care of COVID patients, components and challenges of acute rehabilitation in COVID, and also the clinical presentations of COVID-19 patients. And most importantly, she will uh, use some uh, you know, the case studies uh, related to acute rehabilitation of COVID patients. So stay tuned uh, with us throughout the webinar to grab the most out of this great opportunity. Uh, with those words, let me share some housekeeping items. Uh, this whole session will consist of two parts. First part is the webinar session and then the Q&A session, approximately one hour uh, for the webinar and about 20 minutes for the Q&A session. Uh, so the audience will be kept uh, muted by the organizers during the webinar session, uh, but uh, you can send uh, your questions to the chat box and I will present those to the speaker during the Q&A session. Also, you will get the chance to unmute yourself and present your questions directly to the speaker at the Q&A session. Uh, in addition, and in addition uh, to the Zoom platform, you can join us through YouTube Live, live as well. So uh, without further ado, 
I would like to invite our great uh, guest speaker, Samantha Cook, to start the session. Samantha, over to you. Lovely, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Samantha, it's audible. Great. Firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I hope you have all enjoyed your physiotherapy week and I'm very pleased to share with you some of our experience here in London um, for the acute care and rehabilitation um, of COVID-19. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes, on the weekend. Fab, great. Yep, so um, as mentioned already, so I'm going to touch a little bit on acute physiotherapy care and what our role was during uh, this pandemic, what the components of rehabilitation are and the challenges of rehabilitation within COVID and how they differ from our normal times. And then some parts on clinical presentations of COVID. And then what I've decided to do is kind of work through a case study of what a typical rehab patient looks like for us in ITU. So this is a photo of the Royal London Hospital. So Bart's Health NHS Trust is the largest trust in London. And during the first wave of the pandemic, I was on a separate site, the site that I'm currently on now. Um, and that was to lead with our patients who received extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. We were commissioned as a surge center to provide ECMO for COVID patients during the first wave. And then during the second wave, I was redeployed to this site at Royal London, um, where we opened up two extra floors and were the main hospital site for London for all of the COVID patients in ITU. So this is just some of the things that we are involved with as physiotherapists. So weaning from oxygen weaning oxygen, oxygen, weaning from ventilation. We're very much involved in proning. And then we're also involved in teaching and education around proning ventilation for people who were redeployed from other areas to support them with working in ITU. So just to begin with, I've just touched on a couple of these things to talk about what we were involved in. So proning, proning became very much a part of our daily routine um, and we worked as part of a proning team, as part of the multidisciplinary team with doctors, assistants and also non-medical staff as along with nursing staff. And our criteria for proning is a moderate to severe acute respiratory distress syndrome and that was defined as a PF ratio of less than 150 millimetres of mercury. Sorry, I'm just getting some lines on my screen there. Um, PF ratio being uh, the amount of oxygen that is within the blood and how much oxygen is being delivered. And uh, at the minimum of 60% oxygen delivery. Now, in all honesty with you, most of our patients were on 100% of oxygen. Um, so they met this criteria quite easily. We would look to try and prone people early in the course of the disease. And what we found is that we kind of were looking for a stepwise progression in if we were to prone our patients, was there a slight improvement which would then indicate we would look to prone them again. As mentioned before, we're also involved in teaching and training, and this includes junior doctors, non-ICU staff, people that were redeployed from other areas such as wards. So we delivered um, teaching in the form of either remote courses or face-to-face -face in how to um, prone our patients so that we have more availability for people um, to complete the proning. There were a fair complications which arose after people were unproned or when they stepped down from ITU. And these include peripheral nerve injuries, so things like foot drop, brachial plexus injuries from shoulder positioning and prolonged sustained position being on their front with their shoulders extended. Facial edema and pressure sores were one of the most prevalent complications. And there were some ocular injuries and corneal abrasions, which we were mindful of. So here are some pictures to demonstrate our technique for proning. Um, so we use what we, we call here as the Cornish pasty technique in which we, we roll the patient up with two sheets and using pillows. And this guidance came from our, the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine, um, who had very clear guidance to support us with proning. So we adopted their approach to take forward. Ultimately, this ended up in our patient being on their front and we proned our patients between 12 to 16 hours. 
sometimes longer, sometimes a bit shorter. Again, this also depended on staffing and skill mix of availability to prone and deprone. We aimed to try and change the head and arm position every two to four hours. And in an ideal scenario, we were looking at a minimum of eight hours of deproned before we reproned. Re However, to be honest with you, a lot of the time our patients became quite unstable, high oxygen requirements, poor gas exchange, and which required them to be reproned sometimes within an hour. And then we, I'll touch on this a little bit later, uh, but secretion clearance on deproning. So what we found is actually when we turn people on their front, initially we weren't expecting to have a lot of involvement with chest clearance with a more of an inflammatory response of COVID, but actually um, that postural drainage element of lying in prone meant that we were able to clear the chest and there were quite a lot of secretions there as well. Weaning from ventilation and oxygen. So, with high oxygen requirements, obviously there isn't a, a limitless supply of oxygen. So we were at risk of running out of oxygen at one point. So at which point we established a daily oxygen ward round for weaning the oxygen down. Again, this would be perhaps just a morning ward round as we um, reviewed the observations of each patient's bed space and see whether actually anybody was appropriate for weaning oxygenation. Daily weaning for those that were appropriate. So we weren't involved in everybody's wean from mechanical ventilation, but those that potentially a little bit more complex, so those who were also participating in rehab as well, then we were, we were also involved in their weaning. During the first wave, we did have some complications of upper airway swelling. So we had some instance where on extubation, removal of the tube, um, there was limited airflow, um, again, because of upper airway swelling. So then we started to look at initial cuff deflation to ensure there was adequate airflow before we took the tube out. And again, this is, was much more of a medical management. It's just something that we were also very aware of. And then slightly different um, techniques in terms of weaning. So during our first wave in the pandemic, we very much were looking to try and avoid aerosol generating procedures. So we would wean from our pressure support ventilation once our patient was sedated and uh, off sedation and appropriate for weaning to continuous positive airway pressure rather than going straight to a tracky mask. And again, that was because of the exposure from taking the patient off the ventilator um, and that aerosolization. And then we weren't doing any cuff down or speaking valve trials during the first wave. And again, this is because of the high risk of um, aerosolization. However, during the second wave, slightly quicker weaning in that our weaning was predominantly from a pressure support ventilation onto a tracky mask. Um, so again, we found that there wasn't much need for that continuous positive airway pressure in between. And actually our patients were, um, their inspiratory muscle power was, was recovering um, so that they could go quicker onto tracky mask. And then we, we completed risk assessments for cuff down and speaking valve trials. And again, I think from the first wave, we had a lot of prevalence of delirium, and anxiety naturally given the current situation. So actually to give people their voice as early as possible um, was actually very, um, was became much more of a prior, priority during the second wave. Chest clearance and aerosol generating procedures. So again, as I mentioned, there was an unanticipated chest clearance requirement. We were very much of the view during the first wave that this was an inflammatory response, not a infective exudate um, however, we also found that a lot of our patients due to prolonged mechanical ventilation and um, reduced sort of chest clearance, our patients were also getting superimposed chest infections. So things like Pseudomonas and Legionella, which then obviously led to an increased secretion load. So we were much more involved in the um, secretion clearance. Again, proning added that element of postural drainage. So when we turn our patients back over, there were copious secretions coming up. Um, but also things like vibrations, positioning, manual cystic cough were all techniques that we use for chest clearance. Manual cystic cough in particular, because a lot of our patients were are sedated and paralyzed, so had no cough at all. So at times for them, we would prophylactically manual assistly cough them um, rather than those who were on a lighter sedation and were still intubated and had suctioning completed, were able to stimulate a cough were at less risk. What we didn't do, so we didn't do anything where we disconnected from the ventilator, such as using a cough assist or intermittent positive pressure breathing. 
manual hyperinflation, again, disconnect from the um, ventilator, and also potentially ventilator hyperinflation. Now, that one's in an orange color because there were times where we did use this or potentially modified form, and it was based on the patient's poor lung compliance. So a lot of our patients were on high peak airway pressures, really poor lung compliance. So actually trying to deliver more breath in there, it was not going to be beneficial at this time. And I've just included a paper here, which is from um, Claire Black and colleagues at uh, University College London, who actually put the data out there in terms of their patients that were intubated and ventilated and how much secretion burden they had. So they found 62% of their patients demonstrated a moderate or greater secretion load. And this was new information for us, basically. Okay, so moving on from kind of the acute care side and looking at components of rehabilitation. So rehabilitation is restoring the normal function to an individual. So it has lots of components to it. Exercise, strength, endurance, pain and sedation management, early mobilization, speech and swallow sleep, delirium, psychology, um, rather than just thinking about rehabilitation in terms of exercise, actually all of these things contribute to uh, that recovery process. So with this in mind, the Society of Critical Care Medicine um, have put together the PADIS guidelines in 2000, they were updated in 2018, and the PADIS is for the prevention, um, so sorry, not prevention, pain and agitation management, delirium, immobility and sleep. And again, this is with a view of promoting, and there's good evidence to support this, um, this guideline in terms of promoting liberation from um, ITU. So this is what we normally work towards in our ITU. So pain and sedation management, so should be guided by routine assessment. We're looking for a light sedation. Um, so we use the Richmond agitation and sedation scale and looking at between sort of uh, minus two plus one. Um, and that was associated with shorter time to extubation and reduced tracheostomy rates. There's also some uh, evidence to suggest that's associated with re reduced delirium as well. Delirium management. So delirium is associated with an increased hospital length of stay and ICU length of stay. It is multi-component. We try to aim for non-pharmacological interventions to improve delirium, um, things like um, orientation charts and clocks and daily conversations with patients to try and orientate them. Um, we're looking to improve wakefulness, reduce um, visual or hearing impairments. So delirium plays a big role in uh, what we do currently. Early mobilization, so this is kind of where we come in. So early mobilization, rehabilitation, significantly improved muscle strength at discharge and reduced duration of mechanical ventilation. There is low quality evidence to support this, um, but what we do know is that it is safe and feasible as there are minimal adverse events reported. So the benefits outweigh the risks. And sleep disruption, so poor sleep is a common complaint in ITU. Um, this, the guideline does recommend a sleep promoting protocol and discourage the use of sort of um, sedative agents and sleep agents. So this is what we aim for normally in ITU to try and you know, encourage that positive trajectory of recovery and get patients off of ITU. The Society of Critical Care Medicine have put a bundle in place, again, to help to promote this. Um, so A is for assessing management, uh, assessing, preventing and managing pain. B is for your both spontaneous um, breathing trials. C is for choice of analgesia and sedation. D is for delirium, so your assessment, prevention and your management. E for early mobility and exercise and F for family engagement and empowerment. So based off of those recommendations and guidelines, we try to implement this bundle again to promote that, that um, positive recovery and rehabilitation, which ultimately results in uh, liberation from ITU. But what were the challenges in COVID? So for us here, staffing levels. So we had um, a lot of sickness, again, either personal sickness or isolating sickness. And then due to the increased number of beds that we expanded to, we didn't actually have the staff to support that. So we had reduced nursing staff, consultants, therapists, healthcare assistants. Another challenge of working in PPE, so working with a face mask and a visor. A, it's very difficult to identify who is who and who works in what area. Uh, B, it's very difficult to, to understand each other. So we had trouble with the reusable mask of actually being able to hear each other speak during times of doing rehabilitation and the same with visors. And then we also, you know, our patients are waking up and seeing somebody pretty much with their face 
ultimately covered other than the eyes, which again probably promotes anxiety. Pharmacy and medications. So again, increased security of our patients, increased volume of our patients. We were using a lot of um, sed uh, sedatives, uh, which actually then reduce the availability of some sedatives. And then also sedation practices. So because we weren't, we didn't have our one-to-one -one nursing ratio, some of our nurses were looking after three patients. It was very difficult if we were think back to the PADIS guidelines of doing those daily sedation holds and keeping people in light sedation, because actually, you know, we didn't have that observation and close care for those patients to be able to work towards that. Equipment, environment and space. So again, because of we, us introducing more beds into the same space within an ITU, we did open the two floors at the Royal London, but here at St. Barnes, we, we increased certain areas. So we had extra beds. We had reduced space around the bed space for doing rehabilitation. We had the same number of equipment for our reduced number of patients. So things like chairs. Um, we weren't able to offer sort of privacy for people. Again, we were using sort of temporary screens. And again, to have that Nightingale style ward where you were able to visually see all of the patients was more of a priority at this time than offering patients their privacy. And overall, because of the acuity of the patients and the number of the patients, there was a change in our priorities. So going back to the bundle, thinking about trying to promote sleep or having a sleep protocol, at this stage, we were just trying to keep people alive. And no visiting. So we normally have unlimited visitors for family to come in. You know, they also play a huge role in the recovery, reassurance, um, reducing anxiety, just normalizing and humanizing the ICU. So these were the challenges that we experienced within um, COVID. So then if we think back to those original guidelines, what we were able to achieve or not achieve because of the current situation, the challenges. So pain and sedation management, our patients were fully sedated and paralyzed for a really long time. So plus plus use of benzodiazepines and neuromuscular blockade. And again, we weren't able to do those daily sedation holds due to staffing levels. Delirium, so we weren't able to use clocks or wall charts for orientation. Our patients were waking up with people in masks and their faces predominantly covered. They, weren't, um, they were unrecognizable. Um, early mobilization, so patients were slow to wake and rehab. Again, they had that lasting sedation because of being on those neuromuscular blocking agents and those benzodiazepines for quite a long time. These patients were densely, densely weak. So actually there wasn't a lot that we could do in the very early phases. So that's severely limited exercise tolerance. Also then we had limited staff and skill mix of staff. So we had a lot of redeployed people that didn't normally work in ITU. So actually, you know, there's a safety element here as well. And sleep disruption. So again, we this was deprioritized given the current circumstances. We didn't have any strategies to improve sleep. And basically right here, we're asking our patients to run a marathon at best of, on, of like 30 minutes of deep sleep, even if they got any deep sleep. And then ultimately what this resulted in is um, this clinical presentations of COVID. So this is a paper by David McWilliams and colleagues that basically did a, um, an observational study looking at how their patients presented in ITU with COVID-19. And they found 100% prevalence of ICU acquired weakness. And again, that, that's huge. And again, it's the, referring back to that, the, the guidelines, again, sedation practices, there was no early mobilization, people were densely, densely weak. We couldn't get them up. We couldn't do any more at this stage. Delirium was at 69%. So again, a huge, a huge impact there. And out of those patients, 90% of them received neuromuscular blocking agents. So again, all of these things have contributed to the clinical presentation of COVID, whereas the actual COVID itself doesn't necessarily present differently from somebody with like acute respiratory distress syndrome. It's more the fact that due to the acuity of these patients and the volume of the patients, this meant that our management was, was considerably different due to deprioritizing other areas, which we normally focus on as well. So these are some of the ways that we try to overcome some of these challenges and these barriers. So staffing level, um, we had redeployed staff from uh, musculoskeletal backgrounds who so worked in outpatients and community positions. We were able to provide some training and support for them to be able to work in ITU. We planned their skill mix. 
Um, and something that's really important is that we started to add in well-being sessions and psychology support for people. Again, because people were experiencing burnout, you know, they're working, we changed our shift patterns slightly so that we did four longer days and worked over the weekend, every weekend. And again, people, you know, it was a considerable burden. Um, so actually in terms of being able to maintain the staff and people to be able to come to work the next day, we needed to start to um, support them with wellbeing sessions and psychology. Working in PPE, as mentioned before, it's really difficult to even recognize who you're working with. Everybody kind of looks a little bit the same. So we, um, we had stickers with people's faces on, which they could use a new sticker each day to stick on top of their gown. And on that, we also wrote our names very largely across wherever we could find space um, so that people were able to identify who we were. And then later on during the second wave, there were new staff stickers, which basically said that like, I'm new to, IT, uh, to ICU. Again, to support those new staff, manage those expectations of what, able, what care people are able to provide at that time. Pharmacy and medications, obviously there isn't anything that we can do about the, the, the limited supply of medications, but we were trying to advocate where possible for daily station holds on ward rounds uh, and support the nursing staff with this. Equipment, environment and space. So we made a list of all the equipment we had available in each, in each ITU. We devised a chair timetable time uh, and we communicated with the MDD, MDT about our plan for the day and thinking about alternate days of wean and rehab. So let's say John in bed seven is on a rehab day on Monday. On Tuesday, we think about a bit more of a wean so actually his chair can be used for, for Sally in bed six. Acuity and number of the patients. So again, I mentioned previously, we got involved, and this is much more in the second wave, in daily oxygen and weaning ward rounds. And again, this would just be around the bed space. How much oxygen can we wean at this time? Um, and again, that, that was very much a physiotherapy um, role in this case. Again, not by choice or that it wasn't part of the medical team. It was more just availability of if we we're seeing these patients, can we wean their oxygen as well as part of our plan and priorities? And then we were also involved in identifying patients appropriate for step down. So we laced with our discharge planning, discharge planner who wasn't present on ITU so, and wasn't in PPE about which patients were appropriate to step down from ITU. In terms of the visiting, so we would make plans with our communication hub to book in for planned family calls. We would liaise with family direct to find out, you know, what does this person like to be called? What are their likes and dislikes to try and humanize the ITU a little bit, make it a little bit less of a scary environment to help with anxiety and delirium. And then Devlin and colleagues came up with, in relation to the A to F bundle in which the Society of Critical Care Medicine put out, um, which was really helpful, that there were, but due to the barriers of COVID and things that I've already mentioned, they've come up with some further, more in-depth um, strategies to try and optimize um, liberation from ITU with using that bundle um, in COVID-19. So what I've done is just include the link down there. I'm not gonna go into deep, it's quite a lot of detail in there, but there's some really good strategies that you can take forward if you find that you're experiencing some of the same challenges. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to the case study. And again, this is just to work through. If you've got any questions, please feel free to put them in the end. Um, but I thought this would be quite helpful just to talk about what we're looking for in acute rehab within, with a COVID-19 patient. So we're gonna work through it step by step and looking at when is the right time first. So how will we find, how will we determine is our patient appropriate for rehab? How we will do it, which also includes your risk assessments, safety, staffing environment. What actual intervention we'll be doing at this phase and, and then how we will look to progress that. And then what are the next steps from there? So when is the right time? How do we know if our patient is appropriate for rehab? So we use the multi-systems assessment. This is an A to E approach. We have also used sort of like a, um, a CNS, CVS, respiratory approach. It doesn't really matter what you what kind of approach that you use as long as it, is, it gives you the information you need to make, a, um, to make a good clinically reasoned decision. So A is for airway. So this is our patient. Our patient has a tracheostomy in situ. In terms of breathing, they are on a pressure support ventilation, 22 over eight, respiratory rate's 28, saturations are 95, they're on 50% of oxygen. GE is for gas exchange, so your ABG, your arterial blood gas. And what I've just included there is your CO2 at 6.5 and your oxygenation at 9.5. 
C is for cardiovascular, so heart rate is 101, blood pressure is 131 over 55, a MAP of 70, their temperatures within normal range, and they're on um, a little bit of a vasopressor, so they're on a bit of NORAD at 0.03. And again, things that we want to consider, um, a little bit of NORAD, so we need to make sure that a nursing staff is going to be present, should that need to be increased. This is not, for us, contraindicated at this stage. We usually look at NORAD at around about um, 0.1, uh, in which we would thoroughly risk assess um, getting our patients up and mobilising them. Our patient is alert, so we use the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is E, I movement, E4, V for voice, VT, so they've got a tracking in place, so our patient can't speak at the moment, and motor M6, so they're following commands. For a delirium assessment tool, we use the confusion assessment method in ICU, so the CAM ICU, and that's basically a series of uh, movements where we get our patients to kind of squeeze our hands and answer a couple of questions. Now, common theme with this was that we're actually unable to do it because our patients were so densely, densely weak that even if they could kind of, they were able to follow commands and they weren't delirious or confused, they still weren't able to complete the CAM ICU. Um, e for kind of the environment, so looking at our patient has a catheter, they've got a bowel management system in place, they've got art line, um, CBC, ventilator, NG tube and infusions. And again, this is just for your planning and your risk assessment. Um, do we have enough space? Do we have uh, enough space on the lines to move our patient to sit on the edge of the bed? And then what you can do, and again, particularly a lot of our patients hadn't been doing anything at all for quite a few usually aim for is a sort of like a head up 30 this uh potentially deprioritized at time because of other issues so can we sit them fully fully up in the bed first as then we know if we sit them on the edge of the bed they're cardiovascularly going to be stable and respiratory wise and then this requires a discussion with the nursing staff and if you're unsure always discuss with the senior physiotherapist at this stage but currently um, our patient looks appropriate we're aware of how much oxygen they're on, the, any inotrope or vasopressor support. But from this picture, we'd say, OK, at this stage, we're happy to proceed. What I've included here is a paper from Carol Hodgson and colleagues. And this is um, an expert consensus and recommendations on safety criteria for patients that are mechanically ventilated. Um, and they, uh, Carol gives a traffic light system. So if you've not seen this before, it's actually a really good and helpful paper. Whereas um, green being good to go, likely no adverse events for either in bed or out of bed exercises. Amber, proceed with caution, make sure you've done a thorough risk assessment. And red is kind of a bit of a hard stop in that, OK, we're not going to mobilise our patient. So in this paper, they break it down into in bed exercises and out of bed exercises. And again, you have different sections in terms of respiratory considerations, cardiovascular, neurology, um, and again, this is based very much on some evidence that's available, but otherwise expert consensus. And again, it might be different for your ITU, depending on, um, you know, protocols that you have or local, uh, uh, local policies in place. But it'd be good to just familiarise yourself with this in terms of, you know, OK, our patient's got a tracheostomy. That's not a contraindication to get them out of bed. Um, whereas perhaps if their respiratory rate is more than 30 beats per minute, we're going to proceed with caution. Um, and make sure that we are able to support our patients. So perhaps if our patient is on the ventilator and their respiratory rate is quite high, we sit them on the edge of the bed, can we give them more pressure support to maybe support and alleviate that respiratory rate? Okay, so we're happy. We know that our patient is appropriate. Now we're going to look at how we will do it. So this is where your TAL assessment comes in. So T being for task. So this is the first time our patient is sitting on the edge of the bed. And the nursing staff has told us that they can't help at this stage. And again, this is a common theme. So for us over at the Royal London, we had maybe one nurse per three beds. So again, it's, it's unfair to expect them to, um, to be able to assist us in this situation. I'm not saying that they absolutely can't, but again, that is just a conversation with them at the time. Individual, so we are three physiotherapists. We wanna think about skill mix. So are we three physiotherapists that all work in ITU? Are we 
two people that work in community and one in ITU are we all redeployed musculoskeletal physiotherapists that have never worked in ITU. So things to consider. What's our load? So we have a severely weak patient. They have a normal uh, body mass index, but they do have a tracheostomy and they are on some cardiovascular support. Environment, so we know we're in intensive care where space might be limited. We want to make sure that we are aware of all attachments and lines that are in place. And we have things like slide sheets um, available just in case we need to lie back down quickly. And at this point, again, we're going to communicate with the nursing staff what you plan to do. What's really helpful, if you can, is kind of make a bit of a plan before you go to the bed space. So you kind of have a bit of an idea as like, OK, we, this patient is off sedation. They haven't done anything yet. They've got a tracheostomy. They're probably due for a sit on the edge of the bed before you go there so that you have a good plan in place first. And then you can always complete your risk assessment at the bed space um, as your nurse will play a key role in that. Okay, so our plan is we discuss the logistics. So there's three of us. So there's me, John and Susie. Uh, we all know and happy that we're going to sit on the edge of the bed. We're happy with the patient's history. Um, yeah, and we're all happy with the plan. So Susie is the senior ICU physio and she's happy to look after the tracky. So ideally we always want somebody on the airway. So if the nursing staff can't help, we need somebody who's competent to uh, and happy to, to look after the airway. John is a redeployed band six MSK physio. He's happy to climb on the, the bed behind the patient. Again, we know this patient is densely, densely weak. So the, the chances of them being able to hold themselves up or even hold their head up are probably very unlikely. And I'm gonna be in front of the patient. Fran is our nurse. She's in the patient, she's in the bed next door with the next patient, but she's happy to disconnect anything that doesn't need to be running. So things like feed and insulin um, can be disconnected. We're familiar with our bed space and that we know where the emergency alarm is located and we've got our slide sheets ready should we need to make a quick exit from the edge of the bed to lie back down. Great, so we know our patient's appropriate. We know about our staffing, um, we've done our risk assessment and we're happy with the environment. So now we're gonna look at the actual intervention itself. So remember, this is the first time our patient is sat on the edge of the bed. So we're aiming for fully informed consent and we're always gonna to explain to the patient the plan, the reasons why we're doing it, and to reassure them that if any issues arise, we will keep them safe and put them back on the bed. Even if our patient isn't really alert or following commands, we're still gonna have that conversation with them as we don't know, we still don't know at this point how much our patients remember or how much um, they can understand at one time. So the intervention is individualized. Again, we look for a stepwise approach. So our patient at this time, we sat them on the edge of the bed we had full support with somebody behind. And then, um, yeah, so things we need to be mindful of in, in particular with this cohort that their saturations, their oxygenation levels drop quite rapidly when they get to the edge of the bed. So they do require some support. So we're gonna give some time, boost the oxygen if you need to. You can always increase the pressure support if our patients are feeling a little bit of air hunger. Again, you need to have somebody who is competent with using the ventilator to be able to make those decisions. So this is what we actually did. So our patient only sat for four minutes, again, because they fatigue so quickly. Um, they had an increased work of breathing. Whilst we were in sitting with the trunk fully supported, we just did some gentle passive range of movement of upper limbs and lower limbs. And at this stage, that was more than enough for our patient to deal with. And again, this is quite a common theme. As I mentioned earlier, patients were slow to wake and wean from sedation. There's definitely gonna be some residual sedation there. Um, so that dense ICU acquired weakness very, very acutely is present. So we've done our intervention, all that for our four minutes of sitting on the edge of the bed, but it's a start and that's what we're looking for. Now we're gonna think about how we will progress that. So things we need to consider, dense weakness, recovery times, probably gonna take quite a bit of time. This is their first sit on the edge of the bed. Other things we need to take into consideration when we're doing rehab is, is the patient on a ventilator wean as well? And are they on, are they having a tracheostomy wean? So ventilator wean is, you know, they're um, off of the mandatory mode, they're in a spontaneous mode. Are we reducing this in the daytime? Because you're thinking about exercising your respiratory muscles and then exercising your core muscles and your um, peripheral muscles when you're sitting on the edge of the bed. So actually, do we, need, do we want to think about alternating these so we're not kind of bombarding the patient from every angle? And also think about your tracheostomy wean. So that, in, again, is thinking about your cuff down, um, your cuff deflation trials and your speaking valve trials. 
Again, there's some evidence to suggest that this can promote weaning from, from ventilation, but it's very small evidence. So we still consider an individualized basis as to is our patient able to cope with all of these things together or do we need to break these down? So the recovery was very slow. Um, we need to think about how does our patient do the next day? So some of our patients, we sat on the edge of the bed, they seem pretty perky, you know, we get them back to bed, they're pretty settled. The next day we found out their heart rate's gone up, um, their, their oxygen requirements have increased. So actually that's probably a, a day to say, okay, we're gonna have a rest day today, give them full support and then um, think about rehab the next day. Alternate days in we of wean and rehab. This is an approach that we um, absolutely adopted, and again, for multiple reasons. One, because more is not always better. So even though our patients are density, density weak, and they think, yes, they need physio, they need to get up, they need to do loads, they actually don't have the capacity to do that. The fatigue and the respiratory reserve um, are really limiting factors in this situation. And then also because of our volume of patients, we weren't actually able to do rehab with our patients every day. So coming up with having oversight of the unit and coming up with a bit of a plan as to, okay, bed seven is going to be on a wean day on Monday. So we can, we can do some rehab with bed, with bed six um, really helps in terms of your planning and managing your staff levels as well. We may want to consider increasing your ventilator settings when you're sitting on the edge of the bed. And again, somebody that needs to be competent in um, ventilators to support the patient. So actually do we want to give them a full rest overnight so if our patients are doing a bit of a wean in the day or even if they're doing rehab in the day do we want to consider giving them some increased support overnight so that they can get a full full rest and then reducing that again the next day or do we want to consider increasing the vent settings when we're actually participating in rehab so that they you know they don't feel like they're um, working their respiratory muscles hard as well as all their other muscles and then we want to think about speech and swallow assessment. So as I mentioned previously in the first wave, we very much did not give our patients their speaking valves, again, because of coughing and aerosolizing procedures. Um, whereas in our second wave, we really needed as part of rehab, getting our patients speaking, telling us what's going on, communicating with us, getting them swallowing, which then actually meant that they could start eating, um, which all contribute towards that, re that, that rehabilitation, that recovery. You know, if we're asking our patients to sort of get up and run around, run a marathon, as I say, is was kind of what it feels like for them um, in relation to, to you, know, some, you and I. We're not giving them any food, they're not actually eating. Like we, um, we feed them through NG tubes, but again, sometimes, you know, it's not quite the same as being able to eat your meals every day. So then how do we progress? Um, so we measured our patient for a tilt and space chair. So it's a fully supportive chair and a hoistling. And we would consider a hoist the next day if we had capacity within staffing levels. So again, that's your risk assessment for safety and if our patient is stable. We then assessed for appropriateness for weaning. Um, and then we alternated our days for wean and rehab. We, uh, we have our speech and language therapist that worked with us in ITU. And so we planned for a cuff down trial on a speaking valve. And again, this is a risk assessment in that we want to consider the environment and needs to be an MDT decision as to whether we are gonna proceed with that and the uh, benefits outweigh the risks. And then what we would continue with sitting on the edge of the bed to improve sitting balance, looking at doing some exercise on the edge of the bed. Progressive rehabilitation. Uh, so thinking about going back to our guidelines for sort of like delirium, sleep management, these all contribute towards rehabilitation. So our orientation charts. So we use just like the charts that stick on the wall. And, you know, good morning, Brian, you're in St. Bart's Hospital. Today is Tuesday. Um, again, to help with with sort of day and night routines with people. We try to promote natural light as much as possible. Um, and we work with other members of the multidisciplinary team. So we're quite fortunate here in that we have occupational therapists in ITU as well, and our speech and language therapists. So we all work closely together to make sure that we're all on the same page when we're making a plan for recovery. Goal setting. So where, where possible, we set goals with the patient. We set goals with the family. We um, use outcome measures as an objective way for us to measure, but also to inform the patient of how they are improving. Thinking about humanizing the ITU, we couldn't bring anything in um, because of infection control purposes, um, but we can sort of find out about the patient, things that they like, things that they don't like, and try to involve the family as much as we can. 
We look towards a stepwise progression. So we look to try and achieve sitting balance, challenging that base of support in sitting and try and make things like functional. So brushing hair, brushing your teeth, drinking from a cup and trying to facilitate those normal movements again when we're looking at rehab. And then once sitting balance is achieved, we moved on to things, so uh, bits of equipment. We have an Arjo standing hoist, um, which has a foot plate on it as well which you can then remove as a progression to get them stepping without a foot plate we have other bits of equipment like sarah steadies which again is um, a device where patients are able to pull up onto a bar and then there's a little seat behind them and then moving on to like your related frames or your walking sticks so we've looked at how we will progress now so what are the next steps and what are the things that still kind of present a little bit later on down the rehab phase so our patients were stepped down earlier than usual. So we um, used outcome measures and then measured this between our normal patients. So we used the Chelsea Physical Assessment Scale to look at how our patients were scoring um, outside of a COVID ITU and then with our COVID patients. And they were definitely stepped down much earlier. And again, this was usually due to flow issues, bed availability, um, yeah, and to be able to get people uh, onto the ward. So they had more ongoing complex needs than our normal patients that stepped down from ITU. And in ward rehab, now I wasn't as uh, much involved in ward, re ward rehab, I was very much in ITU, um, but we targeted large muscle groups. And again, this was because of fatigue. There was a lot of ongoing breath assist management, so um, disordered breathing patterns, um, and again, pacing and advice. There were still some ongoing oxygen requirements, which again, we were still looking to wean. And we had some central and peripheral nerve injuries. So a full neuro assessment as early as possible will, will um, identify these issues and then dictate kind of your rehab plan from there and potentially could change your rehab pathway. And then we looked towards your standard progressive strength and endurance exercises and then moved on to discharge planning. So what we found, we this was our follow-up clinic for COVID ITU, and the, we established this clinic um, quite rapidly, I'd suggest, and a couple of our, uh, well, one of our physiotherapists who was shielding and working from home was able to participate in this. So it was an MDT clinic, which can, consisted of um, ITU consultant, physiotherapist, occupational therapist, and nursing staff. And it occurred approximately three months post-discharge from hospital, give or take a couple of days and maybe even weeks. It was a remote follow-up service um, and it allowed us to um, identify ongoing problems with our patients, signpost them to the appropriate resources or make referrals to the appropriate services. So, and as you can see from the chart, um, it's a real mixed bag, but in terms of fatigue, so everybody that attended the, well, 80% of the people that were in the follow-up clinic um, reported ongoing fatigue. Um, only a small percentage of people had returned to work at three months. There was some cognitive changes, breathlessness again, over 50% breathlessness, um, and still some global weakness or some local weakness in certain areas. So despite um, discharge from hospital, our patients still have quite a, a high ongoing need. Um, and again, whether this is related to COVID itself or actually the management of COVID or the fact they stepped down from ITU sooner um, or staffing levels, it's really, it's difficult to tell. But I just thought that this was quite interesting to share with you in terms of the ongoing needs post, post ITU. Okay, so then just to summarize, um, rehabilitation is multifactorial, work as an MDT. And something I think is really key to point out is that the actual signs and symptoms of COVID and how they present isn't necessarily different to what we see, it's the challenges that COVID brings. So the volume of patients, the reduced staffing levels, um, working in the PPE, lack of medication, sedation practices, these are what, these are what actually um, present as the main issues and the complications of COVID and not necessarily the virus itself is not new information to us. So communication is key, working as part of your MDT. So any barriers that are kind of present between like yourself and the doctors, you know, we, we really have to just completely eliminate these to be able to all work in, in unison and on the same page. 
So complete your risk assessment. Remember that this is not a sprint. Burnout is real and staff well-being is important. And as much as it might seem that at the moment when people are in ITU, um, as, as you were saying, you know, it's become part of everyday life, to have that longevity, to be able to sustain working at that level, you absolutely need to look after your own well-being so that you can also support other people. Your comprehensive assessments will identify early complications. And again, your full neuro assessment, really helpful to identify any injuries, in particular people who have been prone. So things like foot drop or brachial plexus injuries and shoulder injuries uh, have been a common complaint from people lying in prone. It's an individualized plan and not one size fits all. So sometimes we have people who had a similar sort of journey to another patient and yet, you know, sort of, Day, day two sitting on the edge of the bed and participating in rehab, anti-gravity muscles. So everybody kind of presented a little bit differently. So we, we treat them that way. We do our full assessment, our systems assessment, which will then be able to give us the tools to make um, good clinically reasoned decisions. Slow recovery. So we want to pace rehabilitation. Um, more is not always better so as much as our patients are weak actually their capacity to participate in rehab was very very you know their, their reserves were very very small so actually you know hoisting out in the chair for a couple of days might seem really passive and our patients continue to be weak but doing more might actually result in patients staying in ITU longer because you know of the increased demand on the body so pacing your rehabilitation is really key Consider your alternate wean and rehab days. Again, as I said, for us, this worked really well. Um, and more is not always better. And then what we've got here with our follow-up clinics, so ongoing symptoms, three months post-discharge from hospital. And again, so that just highlights the need of, you know, um, pathways required, not just for COVID patients, but all patients that have been to ITU, they still have ongoing needs much further down the line. And then what I've just included here is sort of a page of resources that we use to support our management of COVID and ITU at this stage. And then finally, so this is my email address and my Twitter handle. Please feel free to drop me an email if you've got any questions or if I can support with anything more um, or drop me a message on Twitter. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Samantha. It, it was a great session. I hope uh, all, all have grabbed a lot of new knowledge, which will be useful in designing and implementing treatments for COVID patients. Actually, uh, I think uh, almost all of the uh, challenges you have faced and you have been facing uh, in the UK are not new to our people, our healthcare professionals, maybe in a greater extent. We are we have been faced uh, those challenges. And uh, like the areas like psychological issues and cognitive issues and uh, like peripheral nerve injuries. I think those areas should be focused because uh, now we have lots of patients, some are managing uh, at the home itself. So I think uh, lots of new things are there to be considered and uh, like establish approaches like A to A approach. I think uh, that's a good thing to be practiced uh, start back i'm not sure whether that is that has been practiced in sri lanka uh, currently so uh, yes thank you very much so i think uh, next is the time to do any session so let me present you with uh, some questions actually i have one question in the chat box uh, first i will present that then we can give the chance to the speakers uh, to unmute themselves and uh, ask the question directly Okay. Just one question, Samantha. Uh, may, what is the death rate following the bond protocol in ICU? As many studies show a high rate of mortality. Uh, like, if you can. I, like, don't, yeah, I don't know the exact data. Yes. So, ICNARC, which is the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Group, they usually collect all of our data, um, which will show. I don't know if they'll do specifically. I'm just going to put that in the chat. ICNARC data. Um, whether it, there will be deaths from COVID, but I'm not actually aware of the the actual number for that. Sorry. Yes, and uh, the cylinder is uh, there's an, uh, another question from me. Uh, do you rotate to other areas to prevent burnout among staff? I think that is uh, regarding the overburden of the staff. If mm -hmm. you have some wrong, is that is there a practice like that? Okay. 
Yeah. So we didn't. And in particular, because a lot of our other services, a lot of our staff were redeployed to us and a lot of our other services had stopped. So a lot of the cardiac surgery and things like that um, had stopped. We did have some areas where um, we had sort of like normal respiratory wards over at Royal London. But in all honesty, we, we didn't purposely rotate people unless um, individuals in particular were struggling and felt that they needed to from their risk assessment felt that they needed to have some time in a different area uh, we much more tried to look at sort of like a team approach in terms of um, you know sort of well-being and psychology support and actually how can we support you to continue in this environment but if people were struggling then we would consider to move them to different areas but it's not something that that happened to be honest with you with us okay Thank you. I think uh, you got a, you got the answer. Uh, just another one. May I know the basic requirements of the patient should have before planned early mobilization? I think you uh, like introduced a super particle uh, regarding this early mobilization. Uh, so apart from that, uh, can you add something? Yeah. So we again, this is your multi systems assessment. So we look at um, your central nervous system. So is a patient awake and following commands? Again, it's not a contraindication if they aren't. Sometimes we have disorders of consciousness patients, which we would still get them up and sit them on the edge of the bed. Um, but things that would limit us would be um, like spinal drains or um, ICP bolts, things like that measuring like intracranial pressure or, you know, any fractures, things like that. Um, in terms of uh, cardiovascularly, again, we look for, is there stability? Are our patients stable when they're rolling in the bed or moving in the bed? Um, do they, are they on any inotropes or vasopressors, which might mean that actually that requirement supersedes the, the, the need to get the patient up, if that makes sense. Um, CNS respiratory wise. So as long as our patient is um, off of sedation, even if they're on a ventilator. So sometimes we mobilize patients with ET tubes or we mobilize them with tracheostomies. Um, a lot of the time it is with a trache. And then obviously if they're not intubated at all, then we would get them up and move them. Um, but that also thinking about sort of like the oxygen demand of exercise. So Claire Black did some work with um, sitting patients on the edge of the bed and how much sort of oxygen that that required. And do we need to support that more? Again, it was quite, it's a, it's a small study. So again, it doesn't contraindicate to us. It's just something that we take into consideration. If our patient is in kind of in a, a metabolic state already, perhaps they're, you know, they're, um, uh, they're a little bit septic um, and again we would tell that from cardiovascularly, inotrope support, respiratory requirements. Um, is rehab going to be appropriate to get them up if we cause an exercise response? Could we potentially make them more septic? So again it just comes from that full comprehensive assessment um, to determine whether a patient is appropriate or not. I realise that's a clear as mud answer but um, there's no, if you refer to the um, Carol Hodgson paper, which had the traffic light system in place, that's actually really good in terms of being able to determine when a patient is appropriate for, for rehab or not. Thank you. Uh, I got a direct question. What strategies did you employ for hospital staff burnout? Uh, what are the strategies? They're asking about the hospital staff burnout. What are the strategies you are using there? What's that? For, sorry, for neurophysiological facilitation? Uh, no, regarding the hospital staff burnout, what are the strategies you employ because of high burden of the staff due to... Uh... What are the studies for burnout, did you say? Yes. yes. Sorry, I've got some drilling going on outside now. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. I, we just go by our, um, our staffing, really, and have like temperature checks with people to see how well they're doing, whether they need to take, you know, slightly more well-being time or... Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not actually aware of the studies. Then uh, I'll present the next one. Did you use neurophysiological facilitation techniques in ICU for COVID-19 patients? Maybe speaking about the CNF techniques for COVID patients? Yeah, or maybe like neuromuscular like stimulation. Um, no, we didn't. Um, again, we just got them up. Um, get them sort of weight bearing as early as possible and again i'm not really sure the, if there's any literature around that either uh, the next question in view of the M mdd approach how do you engage the counselor or psychologist per se if the client 
refer by the doctor or the team member. Maybe this is regarding the psychological issues like delirium. So is that, can you answer that? Yeah, of course. Um, so we, we're quite fortunate. We have occupational therapists in ITU, which also help with delirium management. We have a dementia and delirium team who would help to support with. Um, the problem is that's one person. And, you know, at one stage we were 200 ITU patients. Um, we, we have a psychologist in ITU, which we can refer to directly. That person comes to our multidisciplinary team meetings in which we're then able to highlight people for them to come and support. Um, difficulty was... Uh, PPE so a lot of the psychologists wouldn't come into the ITU so then they would follow them up on the ward and then the on the reverse of that at our current site our psychologists only work in ITU so we might have patients that step down to the wards with ongoing issues but actually they're not funded as a service for that um, so that's something that they're looking at um, to try and get some funding to support psychology on the wards as well but yeah we we're, we're quite fortunate in that we can just refer direct to them and they are on site with us. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Chandilika Rajasan. Uh, it's your chance. You can uh, answer ask the question. Is that sorry? Dr. Chandilika, you can present your oh. question. I think he organizing team should uh, allow him to unmute. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Samantha. It's a nice presentation and nice discussion going on. So I would like to ask three questions, actually. Uh, one thing is, uh, it is from uh, Sri Lankan experience. And um, uh, so uh, there are many uh, like uh, incidents that uh, we, uh, our colleagues say that uh, uh, there are patients who are like, uh, you know, recovering in the ICU and who are about to transfer to the ward, like uh, so when they are going next day, uh, uh, so the uh, people are dying. So uh, regardless of the improvement, so is 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 this is a common situation in uh, there as well? Like you know, pe uh, people are like almost about to uh, you know transfer to the ward, normal general ward, and uh, so it's like suddenly getting arrested. So is this? maybe a difference in medical management. So this is because I'm asking this, uh, if this was a like rare incident, uh, I would not have uh, uh, asked this, but uh, this is becoming a common incident uh, that is reported by our colleagues uh, who are working in the ICUs and all. Um, and the, the secondly, the, uh, the second question is, uh, that is there any evidence on impact of severity in the acute stage of COVID-19 disease in rehabilitation? And thirdly, uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, whether there is any steps that you have taken to uh, improve the quality of life of uh, physiotherapists because uh, we see that the physios are like exhausted in Sri Lankan setup with uh, less staff and uh, all those things. So. I would be glad to hear your uh, answers. Yeah. Can you just repeat the second question? It was evidence. Sorry, for... yeah. 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 Is there any evidence on impact of severity at the acute stage uh, uh, for rehabilitation? Impact of? I mean, uh, like, uh, so uh, is there like, uh, uh, so high, high the uh, big, if we say like this, uh, if the severity is uh, no, uh, severe, patients are uh, like difficult to uh, recover, like you uh, know uh, something like that, or get, get delayed in rehabilitation when they are uh, like uh, coming back to the society. Okay, uh, yes. I think I got that. Recovery of the severe patients, I think. Yeah. Um, so your first question with mortality, that isn't something that we experienced here. Um, from what I can gather, what you're saying is the patients were due for step down from ITU, went to the ward and then arrested on the ward. Is that right? Yes, I think that's right. Uh, although they are planning to send the patient back to the ward from the ICU, but still on the next day, they get to know that patient has died. 
Yeah. So it's the same incident is happening in UK as well because this has become a common thing in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, we ha- we haven't had that. We we did have a couple of patients which then bounced back to ITU, but it has been usually due to oxygen requirements that can't be supplied on the ward. So perhaps if they needed like non-invasive ventilation or reintubating. Um, I know there has been some evidence of um, effect on cardiac function with COVID nineteen. But we, as far as I'm aware, we didn't have any instance where patients then stepped down and died. They unfortunately either died in ITU um, or were, if they got stepped down to the ward with a view that they weren't appropriate to return back to ITU, if that makes sense. So perhaps they had um, treatment escalation plans in, in place that meant that they weren't appropriate to return to ITU, may have then died on the ward, but not as acutely as what, it, what you're saying by, by the sounds of it. The second question, so is in like delayed recovery. Um, So obviously we have the follow-up clinic from three months. Um, I'm pretty sure that there's some other data out there from like six months um, for COVID patients, but obviously still, it's still quite new at this phase and knowing sort of beyond that, I mean, one year sort of later um, from your initial patients, uh, hard to know, but they absolutely don't recover as quick as your, like your routine ICU patients and they do take a long time and I'm sure that there will be some data coming out in terms of people's ability to return to work or you know like their normal exercise tolerance because of the prevalence of long COVID within our cohort um so yeah I do I definitely do think that there is a delayed recovery of those patients and then in terms of quality of life so well-being so we put things in place where we would add in um, a yoga session so we would ask our physiotherapists if they wanted to participate and offered um, a yoga session uh, once a week and then we would also um, add in time so we'd offer people sort of 15 minutes 15 20 minutes a day where they would be able to take you know just go and have a cup of tea sort of sit down relax and then more structured we booked regular psychology sessions within small groups in which we our psychologists um, facilitated people sort of talking about how they're feeling what kind of strategies can they put in place to actually promote self-care and sort of change the thought process behind self-care as being like you know, I'm just going to go and take a bubble bath, but actually being able to say no and understanding what your remits are. So a lot of our um, therapists kind of struggled with even just conversations with people that weren't experiencing the the stress of working in COVID and being have, having to explain that to people. So we, um, our psychologists tried to support them to kind of like have some space or, you know, take a slightly longer journey home so that you don't go back and have to sort of answer all these questions, especially if people had sort of people living in the same house who were also isolating and, you know, and actually or isolating or working from home and didn't actually get to speak to many people. Um, we, we were very much encouraged to find our ways and things that we like to decompress. Um, so for me in particular, I, I do a sport called Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but then unfortunately during the pandemic, I haven't been able to participate in that. So I've been doing things like running and cycling. Um, as a way to kind of uh, decompress from the situation going on. But yeah, we did, we did uh, have some regular wellbeing sessions and more structured psychology sessions. But we just, we listened to each other, you know, were people interested in having sort of a bit of a yoga meditation session or did they just want some time by themselves? Or, you know, could we offer um, some time over in different areas of like wellbeing spaces? We had some quality improvement leaders actually generate some proper wellbeing spaces as well, in which um, kindly some businesses gave sort of like free food and things like this. Uh, I think people felt a little bit more valued um, with that. Um, yeah. I hope that answers. Thank you, Samantha, for answering the question. Right. I think Felix, uh, I, I don't think that the question he has uh, given some point. I think COVID 19 also have hypercoagulation complication and cause pulmonary embolism. Maybe uh, something to add uh, regarding the complications. Yeah, and it's not also pulmonary embolism. We also saw people who had had strokes from clots or peripheral nerve injuries from clots. Um, It wasn't as, I'm trying to remember if it was more prevalent in the second wave or the first wave. Um, We didn't have a high prevalence of it, um, but uh, it, it's definitely a complication of COVID. Uh, and uh, again, uh, another question regarding this neurological complications. How, how can we help COVID patients with post-COVID neurological syndrome as some of the post-COVID 
patient who experienced neurological syndrome, syndrome maybe like peripheral nerve injuries related to that or uh, what we can do to help them yeah that, this is probably a little bit outside of my remit and probably more sort of your outpatient neurological physiotherapists um who would be able to advise on that to be honest with you yes thank you uh, yes if the we have like another five minutes if you have any more questions you can present or you can just unmute yourself and you can ask Uh, how about the severity of patients having the both vaccines over the patients without any vaccines having only? Um, so this is something we're seeing uh, a lot of now. So a lot of we are in particular the Royal London Hospital located in an area of London, which is has the poorest borough in London. Um, and due, there's also a really low something like 30 percent uptake of the vaccine within that area. So unfortunately now, more admissions that are coming in are considerably younger people who are not vaccinated. Yeah. And obviously during the first wave and the second wave, we were only starting to then roll out the vaccine anyway. So those waves were both quite severe, but what we're having now in particular is not seeing people who are double vaccinated coming to ITU, but those are not vaccinated at all. I think this is Sri Lankan uh, statistics also suggest that regarding the vaccines, so when you compare with the uh, single dose people and double dose people, people and uh, without the, uh, people without any uh, dose of vaccine, I yeah. think that, that is the same statistic uh, here in mm -hmm. Sri Lanka as well. So uh, next question is again regarding the coagulation complications. Are there mm -hmm. post-COVID neurocoagulation complications? Um, again, probably a little bit beyond my remit, uh, not uh, in terms of neurocoagulation complications, I'm assuming you mean sort of like complications, um, like central nervous system complications. Um, again, I'm not sure um, of the data of that, to be honest. Um, I would hope that given that people had recovered from COVID at their um, risk of um, sort of throwing off clots and peas had been reduced, to be honest. but. Uh, how about the deep breathing exercises uh, during the acute stage, Samantha? There's a question from Amin here. Deep yeah, we don't do so much of like deep breathing exercises. We predominantly try to get people up and mobilize them. Um, again, if they're able to get up and mobilize them, because that will also naturally help them take deep breaths and increase their functional residual capacity. So we don't specifically teach any deep breathing exercises. Um, we very much just try to get them up and mobilize them as much as possible. Yes. Next one is regarding this uh, chest manipulation techniques. Uh, does percussion act a big role in real clinical setup? Just what? Sorry. Percussion, I think, uh, as a manual, manual breathing technique. Manual techniques. Yes, percussion. Yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so we use a lot of um, vibs and shaking, a lot more of the manual assisted cough on the abdomen, again, to kind of um, reflect the, the uh, contraction of the diaphragm. Um, but yeah, we things not so much percussion, I would say, but more vibs and shaking. And again, it was because of that unanticipated um, secretion burden. So like our first round of ECMO patients, we really weren't expecting any secretions whatsoever. Um, and they were getting, whether it was, you know, a combination of superimposed infections and inflammatory exudate, um, they were a lot of sort of like expiratory vibs, manual cystic cough with lots of secretions coming up. Obviously, what we try and aim for is for if your patient is sedated, for them to be a lighter sedation to elicit a cough is going to be your best sort of like your first port of call. But um, sometimes that's not possible. So then that's when we come in to try and facilitate that sort of cough action with our manual techniques. Yes. So I think the next question was regarding that. I think you, uh, the person has got the answer for that as well. Yeah. Uh, yes. We can take another two or three questions. If anybody has any questions, and feel free to drop me an email as well, if it's not, or if it's something you think about later. Yes, 
uh, I think uh, most of the things covered and you answered the questions. I think actually the presentation itself was a very clear one. And uh, yes, we'll take this as the final question. So how common DVT in acute setup? Deeply. Yeah, so uh, again, we had minimal prevalence, but I think also because a lot of our patients were anticoagulated as a prophylactic measure. I think once it became sort of common knowledge that COVID had a risk of um, throwing off clots and things like that, then and because our patients are immobile for quite some time, then we um, we put a lot of prophylaxis in situ. So like TED stockings, um, flow tron boots, uh, and getting our patients up as mobilizing as much as possible would help reduce the risk of that. But it was still, I don't know the actual number of statistic wise for uh, prevalence within our ITU. Um, I know there was some, but I think it was quite well managed. Okay. Any relaxation techniques? Yes, I also was to ask about that. Did you any particular relaxation techniques? For the patients yeah so again things like positions of ease so patients we mostly if they were on CPAP and they didn't they weren't so some of our patients were self-proning in CPAP um, to improve their oxygenation but also more for relaxation techniques um, sitting them up out in the chair uh, or a forward lean onto the um, we'd put like a pillow in front on the table and so that they could lean on there um, for relaxation techniques any of your kind of like positions of ease really um yeah high side lying on one side so we'd get them up in the bed with pillows on one side to get them high side lying as well that's what more more positional wise uh, i mean obviously you can go through your breathing control um exercises as well um we didn't use any particular music or anything like that in itu again because we were quite restricted with our resources but you could use things like relaxation music um get um, with patients if you have access to that or um I was going to say they can bring in their own headphones, but it's not quite the same, can you, with infection control? But yeah, or if you have access to headphones for patients, um, would also be an option. Okay. Uh, if you have any other questions, I think uh, someone that kindly shared her email, or we can share it in the WhatsApp group as well. So you can uh, send your questions to her. She will, I'm sure she will answer that uh, when she gets time. Yes, and I think regarding this uh, high amount of uh, patients and lack of staff thing, uh, you presented a nice thing, how a team of physio can work towards a uh, goal uh, when treating COVID patients. So I think uh, once again, I should thank, thanks, thank a lot, thanks a lot to Samantha for kindly accepting our invitation, uh, actually one of our undergraduates first in, uh, invited to and sharing your expertise with us uh, during your busy schedules. Uh, I think we came to know plenty of important points which will enrich the current uh, treatment programs for COVID patients in our hospitals and which will finally benefit them by, uh, like, you know, allowing them to make a proper recovery. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, please give me one moment uh, because this is the last one, last, uh, one of the webinar series. And uh, so I would like to take this as an opportunity to thank the DSWS and the 2018 ALOL batch for organizing this kind of a valuable event. Uh, actually, event series using the maximum available resources during this pandemic situation. I highly appreciate your effort in conducting this series of webinar on behalf of the on, on behalf of all the academic members of the faculty. Uh, and thank you for uh, inviting me to moderate this great event. So, Pasina, over to you. Thank you, sir. I also would like to thank Samantha Cook for in, uh, accepting our invitation and addressing the webinar today. And with that, Colombo Physiotherapy Week 2021 comes to an end, where we successfully conducted a series of webinars on different areas throughout the past week to raise awareness on physiotherapy treatments. Uh, so this outstanding program was proudly presented to you by the Physiotherapy Students Welfare Society of Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. So 
On behalf of the President of Colombo Physiotherapy Week 2021, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Vidya Dyoti Vadiradisar Nayaka, the Dean of Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, Dr. Subhashini Jayavardhana, the Head of the Department of Allied Health Sciences, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, Mr. Ashan Vijay Kohn, the Lecturer in Physiotherapy, Lecturer in Physiotherapy at Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, and the guest speakers of the webinars, the academic and the non-academic staff of Department of Allied Health Sciences of Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, for their support and guidance from the beginning to the end. I also would like to appreciate the presence of our alumni. Sorry, I also would like to appreciate the presence of our alumni, the physiotherapy graduates of University of Colombo, and also the undergraduates from University of Colombo and University of Peradeniya. With that, I'll conclude thanking everyone once again and wishing you the best in all your endeavors. Have a nice day. Bye.